Well, it's, it's a genuine pleasure to be here and, uh, and, uh, and a pleasure to follow uh, Nathan. I always find listening to Nathan's papers that um, I feel that uh, I sort of I find my own ideas constantly being articulated in a maybe a more crystalline manner than, than I do myself, which is either a sign of my profound narcissism, <laughs> right? Or is it the last poem that you were just uh, that you just showed us a virus of my own image, perhaps, or uh, or it's a symptom of our uh, hopefully it's a symptom of our profound sympathy. Yeah. So, um, so with that, then I'd like to begin uh, with two um, just short quotes that in many ways sort of produce a tonality that is not in many ways mirrored in the paper, but nonetheless I think there's an interesting sort of relationship between the two. And the, the, first, the first quote is uh, it's a short one by um, Oswald Wiener. The light only goes out when the skull slaps, uh, slaps against the wall. And uh, the second quote um, which hopefully that's not going to be your experience, right? Uh, being, uh, as well, um, yeah, as I get the paper, but um, it was the experience writing it. <laughs> um, the second quote is uh, from Heiner Müller from a play called Quartet, and uh, the, the sort of character of uh, Mertoy. The agony to live and not be God, to have a consciousness but no power or matter. The shared problem that has oriented the discourse on the so-called end of metaphysics and the attempt to forge a new metaphysics outside the constraints of this critical prohibition, a metaphysics without metaphysics, as Bidu once put it, is that of the event understood as the singular occurrence of the existence, of the existent. Sorry. If I remain, as Kleist declared in a letter to Ulrika, the victim of the folly of having the Kantian philosophy weighing upon my conscience, it is because the intelligibility of this problematic remains irreparably framed by Kantian critique. Kleist's encounter with critique, his so-called Kantkrise, remains irreparably, uh, be, remains, sorry, exemplary precisely for its anomalous extremity, which led to the utter collapse of his theological worldview, his abandonment of philosophy, and his flight from Germany. Critique was the wall against which Kleist's skull cracked. Like Heine's hyperbolic comparison of Kant and Robespierre, Kleist's pathological response to the critique reminds us that despite the doggedly conservative air that cloaks Kant's reduction of the question of being to the, condition, uh, to the conditions of the sense or meaning of its determination, the radicality of critique consists in the absolute scission that Kantian critique establishes between sense or meaning and existence or matter. Note then that the division I here want to stress is not that between thought and being as such, between the phenomenal and the noumenal, right? but rather one that I want to claim is between sense and um, bare existence. Right? What then I'll also sort of refer to as, uh, with respect to the title, as, as lifeless matter. At the limits of Kantian critique, a new conflict is staged between being and the brute indeterminacy of matter, radically stripped of all sense. This is the true import of the transcendental turns, general shattering of received opinion, as Schelling wrote, that heralds a new truth, not so much by providing solutions to pre-existing problems, but by, quote, generating entirely new problems never before considered. With this problem, we shall see that critique does not exit the battlefield of metaphysics, but shifts its terrain. The problem of metaphysics now becomes a battle between sense and nonsense, meaning and meaninglessness, a drama, in short, between existence and life. If this battlefield, as Althusser has suggested, always concerns the interminable conflict between idealism and materialism, then everything hinges on how one thinks the connection between lifeless matter what I will here call, with Kant, the bare existent, and the life of the mind. For although critique bequeaths to us decision between material existence and life, it is also Kant who will introduce a key equivocation between these two terms in his attempt to come to grips with this problem in the critique of judgment. It is thus precisely the problem of the meaninglessness of the existent as such that drives Kant in the direction 
of a vitalization of the problem of existence in the third critique. The effect of which is to resituate decision, right? So decision between uh, meaninglessness and meaning within the field of culture. So this, that's sort of, sort of the general arc of the paper, and um, hopefully it presented very schematically, but it will be clear. It's sort of this articulation of decision at the heart of Kant's first critique. Then I want to maintain that this problem is irresolved by Kant himself, although he notes it. He therefore returns to it in the third critique, um, and that this return introduces or reformulates this very problem as the problem of culture as such. And so that's sort of the arc of the argument. The general thrust of the critique of pure reason consists in curtailing the excesses of reason speculative claims to determine super, sent uh, super sensible entities by binding the structures of logical judgment to the principle that determines the understanding, namely the principle of possible experience. The ground of the whole secret of hitherto obscure metaphysics for Kant, and that's sort of the quote uh, from this famous letter to uh, Marcus Hertz, um, this secret, and the, 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 uh, the secret of hitherto obscure metaphysics for Kant, lies in the operation of the transcendental unity of our perception, of self-consciousness, whose function is to ensure the synthesis of concepts and intuitions. Although this operation is not conditioned by empirical existence, Kant insists that it is occasioned by it. And the very distinction between the transcendental and the empirical hinges on the distinction between the conditions of an objective determination and its occasion. Although this occasion does not function as a condition, it does function as a necessary precondition for establishing the receptivity of the mind. And Kant's worst uh, uh, term for the mind is gemüt, and it's one of these sort of terms that sort of shows up strangely throughout the third critiques, but rarely is sort of subject to, to an analysis itself. And it's, it's precisely later on, and this is not something that I really get into much detail, with respect to, but later on, it's precisely with uh, the determination of the mind is gemüt that the problem of the mind is defined as one of the affectivity of life. So it's just to kind of keep that in the, in the background. Um, for although the mind actively uh, determines that which it receives, it must receive that which it determines. Kant thus splits the mind into two powers that differ in kind, the power of intuition the receptivity of impressions, and that of the understanding, the, sponta uh, the spontaneity of concepts. Intuitions, and this is a quote, intuitions and concepts constitute, therefore, the elements of our knowledge, so that neither concepts without an intuition in some way corresponding to them, nor intuition without concepts can yield knowledge. The object of cognition is the result of a positive synthesis of concept and intuition. Put differently, objective judgments are produced through the a priori operation of self-consciousness, our perception, whose abstract identity guarantees the unity of concept and intuition. However, the emptiness of the transcendental subject depends upon the division in kind between the understanding and intuition. This, this, this difference is not produced by the operation of synthesis, but is the result of the primacy of affection. The fact that its operation is occasioned by the mind's being affected. Meaning or sense is made, and thus ensured, through establishing the synthetic bind between concepts and intuitions, but precisely the difference between the concept and the intuition, established by the occasion of the operation, seems to in turn condition the production of meaning. Right? So, uh, just to be clear, uh, crystal, <laughs> crystal clear, sorry, stop making jokes about that, but I mean, <laughs> just to be crystal clear here, um, what I'm claiming then is that Kant's formulation of the transcendental requires then a distinction between condition and occasion, but then he sort of compromises that distinction necessarily, precisely in order to produce that distinction. So that there's this, ends up becoming an equivocation between occasion and condition, that's a necessary one, to get the critique off the ground. Signification is thus made possible by the difference and necessary relation 
So the difference and necessary relation of concepts and intuition. And Kant writes in the schematism, uh, concepts are altogether impossible and can have no meaning if no object is given for them, or at least for the elements of which they are composed. This structure of signification, of meaning, of zin, makes metaphysics in the pre-critical sense possible as a fictional discourse, as a rational belief in the determinability of supersensible entities or objects, engendering in turn the natural illusions that serve to destroy the culture of reason. And yet the apprehension of the difference that occasions synthesis is precisely that which enables its critical destruction, its separation from itself, right? Namely, that the, the rational attempt to determine an object in itself is destroyed precisely by the recognition of the difference between intuitions and concepts. So the, so the point that I'm making here is, is that metaf Kant discovers with critique both the conditions for the genesis of classical metaphysics and those very conditions of that which allows his critical uh, destruction of it and reconstitution. Okay. So Kant then ensures that the subject of cognition, this, this difference then ensures that the subject of cognition is empty, uh, thereby liquidating the soul of its substance and establishing the non-identity of either empirical or rational intu intuitionism. Now this non-entity, the separation of the thing from itself, depends upon the fact that synthesis, the positing of an object, is occasioned and thus materially inscribed. Of course, all that can be known in the strict Kantian sense is precisely the form through which we determine or mold the object. However, this form is the result of a reduction of the occasioned, the material given, to the condition. This reduction is formalized with Kant's determination of that which affects as something in general equals x. So the formal operation of the I is ensured by a relation to the emptiness of the objective correlate. Thus, the object equals x is the, quote, correlate of the highest unity of apperception. From the point of view of structure, the structure of signification, the real, here materiality, is indexed to avoid a null space within the formal procedure of a priori synthesis. Right? The different, what I'm marking as the difference between concept and intuition. The very possibility of critique thus appears to depend upon an equivocation, or what I just referred to as a reduction, between the act of the activity of conditioning and the passive, the passive movement, so to speak, or passive occurrence of the occasioning operation. Now, uh, in the B edition of the critique, Kant attempts to avoid such an equivocation. So I think Kant is aware that the first critique equivocates in this matter in a way. Um, to avoid such an equivocation by introducing a distinction between categorical existence, so Dasein, existence as the second category of modality, and existence as such. Kant explicitly states, right, in a rather sort of notorious note to the edition, the existence here referred to is not a category. So the existential proposition, I exist, or I am, Kant argues, is prior to the categorical determination of an existent, and, uh, it's essent and it therefore is essentially indeterminate. The relation to indeterminate being or existence as such is given then prior to the logical process of objectification. The existence of the I is not a matter of having the concept, I think, and then seeking its existence outside of this concept, right, the movement of, of synthesis. As Kant writes, without some, this is a quote, without some empirical representation to supply the material for thought, the actus, or the actus, sorry, uh, sorry that's a rather butchered sort of pronunciation. Um, without some empirical representation to supply the material for thought, the actus, I think, would not indeed take place. Kant refers to this pre-categorial material as an indeterminately given object. Kant thus articulates an existent, to quote uh, Reiner Schurman, that is, quote, neither an empirical psychic given, 
because then it would fall directly under the faculties, nor any longer as a noumenal intelligible given, for then it would be pure spirit. Sherman suggests that Kant's reintroduction of the question of being in terms of the indeterminate existence of the I think, uh, of the I think, marks out a pathway internal to the critical system that leads, as he puts it, uh, that leads the way to a non-intuitionist uh, metaphysics. Um, so the, the passivity of sensible intuition entails that the act of spontaneity of reason as legislator, as lawgiver, is initiated by its, recept, uh, its reception of matter, whose place within the system is absolutely necessary, but nonetheless radically indeterminate. The place of indeterminate existence cannot be reduced to the problem of the formal operation of our perception, the pure I think. In, in pure apperception, all that is being thought is, quote, the relation of the self as subject as form of thought. Yet the existence of the I think, its material inscription, concerns the real, not the form of the real, in Kant writes itself. Um, an indeterminate perception here signifies only something real that is given, given indeed to thought in general, and so not as an appearance nor is a thing in itself, noumenon, but something that actually, right, in their tat, so it's perhaps better to say something that factually exists, and which in the proposition I think is denoted as such. Right? So this is a quote from Kant, right, which is a pretty remarkable sort of claim to find in Kant. So matter as such occurs, is given, but, and this is sort of my gloss, without givenness, since its givenness, or in Kantian terms, phenomenality, phenomenality, is posited by the activities of the mind. That is, through the transcendental synthesis of that perception. And it's precisely this act of categorical determination, positing, that empiricizes it. Only after the operation of transcendental apperception and the schematization of the categories is there, strictly speaking, an empirical given, empirical objects that can be signified and thus rendered meaningful for the consciousness that apprehends them. Although Kant denotes it, or this indeterminate existence, as a perception and an object, given the constraints of the critical distribution of the faculties, it is, under, as if, it is unclear whether this existence can either be perceived or an object. If it does not appear, if it is not a phenomenon, how can it be perceived? On the other hand, if it is not a thing in itself, since it is not simply an object of thought, like the metaphysical entities of God, soul, or world, right? so then it can't be just the noumenon. There is thus something in thought in general that absolutely cannot be reducible to it. It is an object, right, under a ratio, you know, that cannot be subjectified. Right? So this sort of, so what I'm claiming is that Kant here sort of dis discovers the problem of bare existence, which would be that of an object that cannot, in principle, be subjectified. And therefore, cannot be an object for a subject. It is something real that, strictly speaking, cannot be signified, that is, schematized. But it can be, as Kant says, denoted. So in terms that Kant here authorizes, we can say it is the real of signification, not the signification of the real. The critical system, then, is ruptured from end to end by the problem of the radically meaningless, uh, meaninglessness and indifference of matter to the depraved animal, to allude to uh, Rousseau's definition of the beast that reflects, that interprets it. Even if Kant shifts the problem of ontology to the problem of sense or meaning, and thus the problems of metaphysics to that of signification, we find at the very center of critique a problem of the existent that occurs, whose being consists in its externality to sense. The essential and total indifference of existence to the rational, is, in, uh, rational interests of the human animal and the life of consciousness is inscribed at the very heart of self-consciousness. Decision between meaning and existence does not pass internal to the mind. Okay, so this is going to be sort of a key point for me. Decision does not pass internal to the mind, but marks rather for 
uh, Marx rather for thought um, that which cannot be internalized. An objectivity that cannot be subjectified. Put differently, it is the external that cannot be objectified for a subjective consciousness. So being um, bare existence marks a limit to the law of synthesis, which is neither internal nor external to thought. I mean, perhaps I should just say that um, neither internal um, to thought, because it is in some sense external to it. But nonetheless, it's not in principle unthinkable. And so that's why I kind of want to, tempted by this sort of paradoxical formulation that is neither internal nor external to thought, because in some sense it's sort of this indifferent center of cognition that nonetheless does not pass internal to it, and in some sense is an externality that nonetheless is the very source of thinking. And the movement towards the internalization of this decision, I think, could be sort of the, described then as the movement of what we could call the logic of life, which I'll see Kant reintroducing in the third critique, but then is also becomes the sort of the way in which Hegel and Heidegger in different ways could take up this problem. In other words, they'll want to internalize this difference as the limit of thought, right? and therefore make thought possible Right, through its encounter with this impossible limit. Now what I'm claiming here is that Kant then marks the problem of an objectivity that in principle cannot be internalized by thought. And that's kind of what is interesting about it. And, and that he himself will in some sense, in the, third, in the third critique, reformulate the problem that will then lead to the dialectical tendency of wanting to inter internalize the, an external limit. And so that what goes by the name of vitalism will be an attempt to restore sense or meaning um, to this meaningless existence um, through the erection of a value that can be affirmed as a whole. The problem of vitalism concerns the manner in which it proposes to think and thus name this scission. And it names it through in the introduction of the concept of life. So I think like the central problem with vitalism, I mean, uh, is that it, it, it's interested in trying to sort of think this problem of singularity, but it formulates the problem of singularity through reintroducing the concept of life, and as a result, it necessarily thinks or equivocates between a singularity that always assumes the place of the whole. So in some sense, it, it tries to think a singularity that is subtracted from, we could say, the dialectic of whole and part, but it inevitably, in attempting to think that, reintroduces a kind of holism, um, which is, I think, I mean, in some sense, the, uh, the essence of, um, of Badiou's critique of, of vitalism. But that's an aside. And so let me now then shift a little bit to the second part of the paper. Um, existence as such, uh, which lies at the crux uh, of the complex conceptual matrix of conceptual ontology, appears to be a corrosive that eats away at the very sinews of sense, at the joints of the structure of signification, the Kant's transcendental turn sought to legitimate. However, Kant did not simply abandon the problem, he returns to it in the critique of judgment. With the concept of reflective judgment, Kant attempts to come to grips with the problem of a singular occurrence, what I've been calling bare existence, albeit within the field of experience. Whereas determinative judgment is essentially subsumptive or schematic, moving from the universal to the particular, Kant defines reflective judgment as moving from the particular to the universal. Reflective judgments are solicited precisely when something happens that um, lacks an appropriate concept or principle that would allow it to be understood. And Kant indexes this judgment to a feeling of life that animates the mind. Quickening, as he says, quickening, this German word is beleben, 
so it has a direct sort of relation, uh, relation to life. Uh, this quickening uh, of the mind, which sort of engenders a play between the, the faculties, like, at least in the case of the judgment concerning the beautiful. In such judgments, according to Kant, the subject is referred back to the affection, to the, quote, feeling of life under the name of feeling of pleasure or displeasure. And this forms the basis of a very special power of discriminating and judging. As such, Kant consigns the thinking of existence to a feeling, uh, to a feeling of life, and thus to aesthetic thought. Life then marks the inscription of material existence into the affectivity of the mind. Yet in uh, reducing the problem of existence to the problem of affectivity as the feeling of life, Kant effectively reduces in turn the radical indifference of matter to human life. And in so doing, Kant effectively transforms the problem of the meaninglessness of lifeless matter into a question of the meaning of culture. For Kant, the aesthetic judgment, the riddle of taste, contains the secret to the difference between the, the, uh, the animal, between, sorry, between animal and human life, and the life of mere, or, uh, uh, the life of mere brutes, and the life of the culture. And the ground of culture, as an autonomous aesthetic sphere, uh, aesthetic sphere is grounded in taste. So taste then becomes this moment in which the human differentiates itself from the animal precisely on the affective level. In reflecting on the feeling of life, in the quickening of the play between the imagination and the understanding, the singular in judgments of taste appears as universal and necessary, and thus a priori, only through mobilizing a series of negations. So the judgment, these are the sort of four moments that, that Kant articulates. The judgment is disinterested, a liking without interest, universal, but without a concept, it is purposive, without purpose, and finally, normative, without a norm. So life becomes precisely that which can be denoted in its singularity only through its evasion, right, the evasion of that very singularity. So it, it, um, it becomes noted only through the evasion of its norm. So oddly enough, the, the structure of aesthetic judgment for Kant has the, the structure of inclusive exclusion, that life is included as excluded. So those of you, I mean, I guess for the first panel there would be maybe an interesting sort of overlap here. The feeling of life, engendered by the experience of beauty, is the experience of exception. So beauty is the experience of the exceptional. As exceptional, what I've been, what I've referred to as existence, right, the external as such, is subjectified as the feeling of life, the feeling of the singularity, of life's singularity, right? this feeling that life is exceptional. It is through these negations that the singular existent, an objectivity that cannot be subjectified, is reformulated by Kant as a question of the relation of the subject to itself. So aesthetic judgments are, as Kant puts it, merely subjective. So, bloß subjective. So, this word bloß comes back. Um, aesthetic judgments are merely subjective and are thus not defined through their relation to the object. Kant thus, through the mediation of the term life, translates or transposes the problem of a radical and senseless objectivity into a matter of, the merely, of merely subjective feeling. And culture then becomes the terrain or the project of animating lifeless matter. This is, a, I mean, I, even I realize it's somewhat of a speculative sort of claim, and uh, I can't really do the hard of the work of, uh, of justifying, I think, the implications of that move. But I actually think that maybe as a, as, a, as a kind of intuition that sort of really presses hard on this determination of affectivity, the affectivity of self-consciousness, self 
as, as Kant puts it, the very principle of life itself. And that's like a quotation. I think it might be interesting. I think it has at least, uh, like, it's justifiable. Um, how am I doing on the time? Am I okay. Uh, okay, well, I'm moving, I'm moving towards a kind of conclusion. Uh, I'm going to have to invent in that movement. Uh, <laughs> finished. Um, so put differently, uh, culture becomes a question of the vitalization of existence the transposition of its ruthless independence into a matter for the enhancement of human life. And so here, Kant's term for the beautiful is that it furthers life, he puts it at one point. So I'm sort of using this term of enhancement because it, it, it enhances in many ways precisely in the sense that, um, that, that um, well, oddly enough, Heidegger too sort of refers to um, Nietzsche's determina light, determina uh, determination of life as, as, um, as intensity, as one in which life enhances itself. And so that here then, it's, it's precisely because Kant here does not want to provide a, a biological determination of life, right? In other words, judgments of the beautiful do not provoke the interest of the human animal, right? So the pleasure experience is not one of interested pleasure, but rather disinterested pleasure. And so the enhancement of human life is in some sense a furthering of life for its own sake, right? Not rather the subordination of the encounter with life to sort of rational ends. Right? And culture uh, becomes precisely a question of life's, okay, a question of life's enhancement of the capacity of the human with taste to distinguish itself from mere beast. And yet this distinction between aesthetic liking and mere agreement consists, as I was suggesting, in a, in a negation. So Kant's formulation of the aesthetic as a form of thought implies that culture is only as a relation to a form of life, consciousness, affection, whose existence for consciousness consists in a relation to the singular, whose form in turn consists in a negative relation to its content. I'm sorry for that. Um, <laughs> um, Say again, Alex. Okay, no. So, uh, Kant's formulation, I would like to think that I did, that was the invented part of the paper there, just moving down, but I actually had to write that. You know. um, Kant's formulation of the aesthetic as a form of thought implies that culture is only as a relation, as a relation to a form of life, so consciousness or affection whose existence for consciousness consists in a relation to the singular life, whose form consists, in turn, in a negative relation to its content. So I'll, I'll expl explicate that in a second. Um, with culture, the formation of the autonomy of an aesthetic dimension. Right? So with culture, distinction of value in a strict sense, takes the place of meaningful cognition. So, right, so I'm claiming then that Kant reintroduces the question of sense or meaning, but now it's not under, obviously, the notion of reference or signification as it's, as it's sort of treated in the schematism, but now it's precisely in terms of value. So it's the life enhancement is one of the, general, the, the creation of value. And Kant claims when we experience beauty, we experience value. And in some sense, that's what differentiates the human's affective life from that of the animal. So the dream of culture I'm claiming here becomes the resuscitation of the carcass of meaning. The emergence of the aesthetic as an autonomous sphere of thought Right, and a priori of its own, to use Kant's terms, coincides with a double negation. So this is the, the sort of double negation then is kind of that more complex formula that I repeated twice. The negation of existence in life, the reduction of matter to sense, so first negation, and the negation of animal life through the production of culture. So lifeless matter is internalized, right, first negation, only through the capacity of the subject 
to separate itself from itself in these, the aesthetic judgment, second negation. So what I mean, basically what I'm trying to, to show here is how there's actually quite a weird complex movement in which this problem from the first critique gets taken up and the very thing that should have not been at all internalizable creates the conditions for its internalization. Right? And then culture as such then becomes the problem. The refusal of the subject to identify the form of its judgment with any content in particular means that its difference from the thing from which it dis uh, it means that its difference from the thing from the thing uh, from from which it distinguishes itself can only be maintained through a process of of, of relentless liquidation. Right? So. I think this is what Hegel is claiming, right? So, I mean, this is something that I really can't go into. I mean, because it's, I mean, it, but Hegel's description of pure culture as, as um, the, is alienation. Um, so, cu pure culture becomes alienation precisely because the conditions for culture, which Kant determines in aesthetic judgment, can only be established through the negation of the content that can only be then in turn denoted through that negation. So Hegel here thinks then that culture itself emerges as, as he puts it, a nihilist play with subjectivity. Right? That, so that culture constantly is creating and identifying itself only through the liquidation of its content. So, and, and there's a sort of nice formulation of, of, of Hegel at one point in the aesthetics, even though he's not really ta he's not talking about culture, he's talking more specifically about um, irony and the romantics. But he describes the, the subject um, as the subject of irony as a self-annihilating nothing. So let me then conclude here. Um, let me then conclude then just with a, with a kind of maybe by reading. What I see is two ways, two quotations that I think sort of chart two ways in which this problem gets taken up. And the first, um, the first quotation is from the beginning of, of, of Schiller's aesthetic letters um, on the, uh, no, letters on the aesthetic education of man. And the quote here, and he's actually referring, oddly enough, to the language of Kant. He says, for alas, intellect must first destroy the object of inner sense if it would make it its own. Like the analytical chemist, the philosopher can only discover how things are combined by analyzing them, only lay bare the workings of spontaneous nature by subjecting them to the torment of his own techniques. In order to lay hold of the fleeting phenomenon, he must first bind it in the fetters of rule, tear its fair body to pieces by reducing it to concepts, and preserve its living spirit in a sorry skeleton of words. And so, now, for Schiller, of course, the whole project of aesthetic education is precisely to overcome what he sees as the, this sort of symptom of intellect, of reason. And for him, beauty thus becomes precisely the harbinger of a living spirit that is undivided, right? undivided. Um, now, I think what I was just referring to with Hegel's critique is also a critique of Schiller. In other words, he's basically saying is culture for Hegel cannot be the site precisely where this, this unity is to be found, because precisely the unity that, that, that Schiller thinks that he finds in Kant's aesthetic judgment is in fact this radical negative activity, this self-annihilating nothing. So rather than actually finding it being a site where unity can be reconstituted, aesthetic judgment actually becomes the very evidence of a culture that is just tearing itself limb from limb. Right? And so what's interesting is also sort of Hegel's charting of the problem of culture and of aesthetic judgment, right? mostly through a reading of, of, of Diderot, of uh, Rameau's nephew. But it's sort of the structure that's already articulating there is precisely also the structure that then culminates in uh, the terror, 
right? So that you, you move from culture to um, the culmination of enlightenment in the terror. So that the self-negating structure of aesthetic judgment then also mirrors the self-negating structure of the terror right, in the French Revolution, this Robespierre and terror. And um, the other quote then that um, I just want to uh, sort of end with, which I think is a slight, um, moves this, this problem in a different character is one from Blanchot, describing the role of the critic. So he's, in playing his role, the critic, as an approximation of his name, would have it. That is, to criticize is to separate, to disjoin, is essentially a destroyer. He necessarily separates the work. He destroys it, not by seeing it as smaller than it is, but by rendering it visible to itself, by setting it a little behind in retreat so that it apperceives itself, um, by organizing a slight void in the work, a void that is its momentarily fixed meaning in relation to the times, to tastes, and to ideas. So here then, Blanche shows sort of allusion to apperception and also to um, taste, I think, is, is particularly significant. So here we have kind of two tendencies that merge out, right? The Blanchotian tendency, which is going to see this moment of destruction as being inherent to the work itself, and so that the critic then is not responsible for the destruction of the work, but what Blanchot will call literature is precisely the self-destructive character of, of art, and, and, um, and, uh, and Schiller's then more, you know, we could say optimistic sort of uh, description of things. So then just to kind of finally conclude then, um, even though I've been promising a conclusion and it's yet to come, this time it certainly will, um, what I want to claim here then, that, that this, the, the question of art here um, that, that emerges, So the question of art here that emerges. So if the work of art, as I'm claiming, is condemned to remain in this vital tension, where it marks in culture the site of a negation of culture's very vitality, then it seems that Baudelaire's formulation is particularly apt. And I just want to end maybe with this quote from Baudelaire. Every artistic phenomena is founded on the existence in the artist of a permanent duality the power to be at once oneself and another. The artist is artist only on condition of being double and of not ignoring any phenomenon of his double nature. The artist is a living contradiction. He has gone outside the fundamental conditions of life. His organs no longer bear his thought. So I guess what, what I think is interesting here is saying that if in fact the problem of art is irreparably vitalistic in, in a certain sense, it's dealing with the life of culture, and what's interesting is, is the movement that emerges precisely in relation to the crisis of culture that sees the task of art as necessarily performing a living contradiction. And so we can oppose then this sort of praxis of art to, we could say, the sort of dialecticization of um, contradiction that is sort of the movement of uh, sublation in Hegel. But let me just, just end with that.